Now it is certainly a, a real pleasure to um, introduce Professor Weikert. We can all look forward to, um, to his uh, talk with keen interest for the questions that he raises are very much with us today. Questions of moral relativism, for example, and the use or perhaps rather misuse of science for ideological purposes. Richard Weikart is a professor of history at California State University at San Stanislaus. And he has a distinguished record in both teaching and research on important matters of science, religion, and culture. To select just a few of his courses that we might like to take or audit, Hitler and the Nazi era, evolution, religion, and society, science and society since Copernicus, and 20th century crisis, the latter course spanning both world wars from 1914 to 1945. Professor Weikert's research is equally fascinating. He has written a book on socialist Darwinism, evolution, and German socialist thought, um, several studies of the famous German pastor and writer Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, and article Darwinism and Death, Devaluing Human Life in Germany, 1860 to 1920. This last article was not only published in the prestigious journal of the history of ideas, but also won the award for the best article of the year in that journal, an achievement that I admire, and to be truthful, rather envy. <laughs> Weikert's latest book, soon to appear, in fact, it is now just tonight in my hands here, soon to appear this year with Palgrave Macmillan. I believe it will be available um, in another month in May is called From Darwin, to His From Darwin to Hitler, Evolutionary Ethics, Eugenics, and Racism in Germany. It explains the revolutionary impact that Darwinism had on modern thought, and it investigates the strange and curious combination of moral relativism with elitism and racism, which at its worst, of course, was expressed in Adolf Hitler's desire to enslave or extirpate what he considered inferior races. Tonight, Professor Weikart will explain from Darwin to Hitler. I'm going to find this important for my own work, and I know that all of us are going to learn a lot from it. Let us welcome our distinguished guest, Professor Richard Weikart. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, not sure I deserve all of that, so I'll uh, just uh, hope that I won't disappoint you in uh, what follows here. Uh, I think this topic we're talking about, truth or consequences, certainly what I'm going to be talking about is consequences of certain ideas, because ideas do have huge impacts. And certainly, if we think about 20th century history, which I teach, I, I teach a course in 20th century Europe I'm teaching right now, uh, we can see the consequences of ideas that have gone uh, astray. We see the consequences of uh, Nazism, for example, and the Holocaust, some of the issues that I deal with in my research. But we also see uh, Stalinism, Marxism, the impact of that that that's had on the world. So I think it's worth thinking about some of these issues and to realize that these really are serious matters that affect people's lives and affect people's deaths. Uh, and so I would like to start here and think about the Veritas form and truth uh, by a word from the man who said, I am the truth. And one thing that he said was, and of course I'm speaking of Jesus Christ, he said, uh, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, I have come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. And so the issues we're going to be talking about today are issues of life and issues of death. And I have uh, entitled my talk, From Darwin to Hitler, which is the title of my book. But I've also given it uh, an alternate title, which is, Does Darwinism Devalue Human Life? And this is going to be one of the key issues I'm going to uh, talk about. And I admit that the title of my presentation, which is also the title of my book, uh, is controversial. And I hope it will stir up some healthy controversy. However, I also need to clear up uh, some possible misunderstandings from the very start. First, nowhere do I argue that Darwinism leads inevitably 
to Hitler, that there's a logical necessity there, or to the Holocaust. To state the obvious, uh, neither Darwin nor most Darwinists are Nazis. Okay, so we need to clear that away from the very start. In fact, in my book, I don't even really discuss, uh, I don't even really make a philosophical argument. I make a historical argument about looking at how Darwinists themselves applied the ideas of Darwinism. So this isn't my philosophical spin on what Darwinism should imply or might imply or even must imply. Rather, I'm saying this is how Darwinists looked at uh, Darwinism and its implications for human life and human death. Uh, I actually state in the very introduction that the readers themselves need to uh, try to think about what the logic is of these Darwinian thinkers. Now, I happen to think there is a certain kind of logic to it. Uh, but uh, whether one agrees or disagrees with that viewpoint, uh, and whether one agrees or disagrees with these Darwinists who I'm going to talk about who did devalue human life, uh, the historical impact of their ideas on Western culture has been immense. And that's what I want to uh, focus on today. I, actually, though, I'm also in this presentation going to go a little bit beyond the material in my book uh, by going on and talking about uh, some of the contemporary Darwinist thinkers who are likewise uh, making some of the same kinds of moves uh, that the people I investigated did. Most of my work was in the late 19th, early 20th century Germany. Uh, and so, but they're also contemporary uh, American and British and uh, German thinkers today that are saying similar kinds of things. Uh, and so I'm going to try to make explicit how these things do relate to contemporary debates on bioethics. A second point that I want to make before I get going is that I, when I began my research, I didn't begin trying to link Darwin with Hitler. I did my dissertation on the uh, impact of so Darwinism on German socialists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And as I was doing that, I began, became interested in evolutionary ethics because I noticed that a lot of these German thinkers were writing about ethics and trying to set up and trying to promote some kind of evolutionary ethic. Uh, when I first started this research, I wasn't even thinking about Hitler. In fact, and I was a little wary of that because there's a book by a, a scholar named Daniel Gassman who's not taken very seriously by most uh, historians who does try to draw a very direct line from Ernst Haeckel, who was the leading German Darwinist, to Hitler. Uh, and he does it in ways that don't really make a lot of sense. And I agree with a lot of the criticisms that have been leveled at him. So I was a little wary of making that kind of connection. Nonetheless, I obviously did make the connection, uh, ultimately. <clears throat> Uh, and I believe it was a case of being driven there by the uh, empirical data that turned up uh, time and again and brought me to the point where I uh, made the connections. But I think in a much more subtle and uh, more uh, truthful way, perhaps, than Daniel Gassman uh, had. There were two reasons that I made this sort of unexpected turn in my research. First of all, as I began studying evolutionary ethics in late 19th century Germany, I started finding out that German eugenicists were in the forefront of talking about evolutionary ethics. Uh, and I hadn't realized that uh, until getting underway with my research somewhat. And so I better say just a little bit about eugenics, because that's one of the themes in my book. Uh, and uh, it has a big bearing, then, on uh, what I'm going to have to say here. Francis Galton, here's a biography uh, of him, is considered the founding father of eugenics. Eugenics was a movement that was very prominent in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to try to improve human heredity. Uh, Galton got that idea, by the way, in part from reading Darwin's Origin of Species by his own admission. Darwin was his cousin, uh, and he imbibed Darwinian ideas. And in fact, all of the German eugenicists likewise argued very strongly that their uh, ideology was based upon Darwinism. In fact, there was a fear among many of these eugenicists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that because modern culture, especially modern medicine, was uh, undermining natural selection by allowing the, quote, unfit to survive and reproduce, that this was producing something of a problem. And so the way to get around the problem of the deterioration or degeneration, as the term was used quite often in the late 19th, early 20th century, the way to get around that problem of degeneration was to use artificial selection. And so this is then what eugenics was all about, trying to use some way of artificially selecting uh, humans uh, to 
produce, to get away from degeneration and hopefully also to then uh, improve the human species and to direct human evolution. So this is one reason then, the issue of eugenics that began driving me in the direction of my research. The second issue was in 1995 I offered a seminar called Darwinism, Religion, and Society. And in that seminar we discussed a book by James Rachels. And that book was called Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Evolution. As we began discussing this book in the seminar, two very bright students in that seminar uh, said that they believe that Darwinism proved moral relativism. Well, that caught my attention, and so I decided to give them a sort of concrete example to see how far they were willing to drive that. And I said, so, okay, what about Hitler? Was, what about Hitler? Was he evil? Was he, uh, you know, what, what would you say about him? And without batting an eye, they said, correct, he was neither good nor evil. You know, they wanted to drive the moral relativism as far as it would go. Uh, I was rather horrified by that, of course. Uh, so that got me thinking in certain ways about Darwinism and moral relativism. Then the second thing uh, about Rachel's book is that Rachel's whole argument is that Darwinism undermines the Judeo-Christian concept of the sanctity of human life. And so that got me thinking about some of these uh, German Darwinists that I'd read about uh, who had, some of them had, had similar kinds of ideas. And, for example, one of them that I already knew about at this point was Ernst Haeckel, who was the leading Darwinist in Germany in the late 19th century and on into the early 20th century. Uh, and Haeckel had, in, already in 1870, proposed infanticide for those with congenital illnesses, especially mental illnesses. So I moved back into my research with this question then, does Darwinism devalue human life, or at least do Darwinists think that Darwinism devalues human life. And I started investigating then these uh, Darwinist thinkers using that question. And that question is very controversial. Does Darwinism uh, devalue human life? There are many Darwinists who will say that Darwinism doesn't have anything to do with ethics or morality. They'll invoke what's called the naturalistic fallacy, which states that you can't get from is to ought. <clears throat> And they will call uh, Hitler's invocation of Darwinism, they'll sometimes call it vulgar Darwinism or distorted Darwinism. I've heard those uh, various terms. However, whatever the philosophical argument one wants to make about that, the plain fact of the matter is historically that many leading Darwinists did and still do today uh, believe that Darwinism does have strong ethical implications. Darwin himself did, by the way. Uh, and there were actually many of them who expressed positions very close to Rachel's own position. And so my research then sort of underlines this train of thought and the implications, or rather the uh, consequences, that it had. Now, I want to talk then about what some of these implications are. And when I say this, the implications of Darwinism for devaluing human life, this is not just my own philosophical spin. I'm giving you what Darwinists themselves are saying about Darwinism. Now, again, not all Darwinists are going to agree with this. I acknowledge that. But nonetheless, there are many Darwinists uh, who do uh, buy into these particular ideas that I'm going to uh, put forward to you uh, tonight. First of all, human inequality. Evolution requires variation. There has to be biological variation for evolution to occur. And many scientists argued, especially in the late 19th century, that that meant that humans are unequal biologically, and they very often uh, spelled that out into uh, all sorts of anti-egalitarian kind of thinking. Uh, Ernst Haeckel, for example, uh, wrote several essays that were strongly anti-socialist, claiming that the socialists were unscientific because they believed in equality of humanity. And he said, no, science proves the inequality of humanity. And he wasn't the only one. There were a number of uh, Darwinist who wrote very strongly against the socialist movement because of this issue of uh, human equality. If you look at the eugenics literature, the eugenics lit literature is replete with examples of people talking about human inequality. Uh, the word inferiority uh, occurs again and again and again and again in eugenics literature. They're, they're concerned about the inferior, and you'll see this in some of the slides I'm going to show you in a little bit uh, here too. Just to give you one uh, concrete example, Hugo Ribert, 
who was a uh, medical professor, I believe he was at the University of Bonn, wrote in one of his books about on eugenics, quote, and this is, again, a fairly similar statement to many other eugenicists, too. This is not just sort of off-the-wall fringe stuff. This is mainstream uh, medical professor eugenics ideology. He said, the care for individuals who from birth onwards are useless alike mentally and physically, who for themselves and their fellow creatures are a burden merely, persons of negative value, is a function altogether useless to humanity and indeed positively injurious. I mean, he used some pretty strong language there to make clear, uh, I mean, words, uh, they're a burden, they're negative value, uh, useless to humanity, and injurious. Those were common ideas uh, at the time about those who had hereditary illnesses, especially mental illnesses. Now, there were two ways that this inequality could work, and it did work this way, in fact, in the Darwinian scene in the 19th and early 20th centuries. First of all, within society. Okay, here I have a, a picture that comes from a, a book by a prominent psychiatrist in Germany in his 1903 book about criminal anthropology, where he shows the allegedly ape-like features of an Italian criminal. This is based on Cesar Lombroso's uh, ideas. Lombroso was an Italian psychiatrist who founded uh, what's called criminal anthropology, and he believed that criminals were a throwback, an evolutionary throwback, uh, and thus they, he thought they would have physical features that were more like apes. And so the sloping forehead, the nose, you know, that was considered ape-like characteristics that these criminals allegedly had. And there were also other Darwinists talking the same thing about mental illnesses, talking about how people who had mental illnesses were evolutionary throwbacks to uh, ape ancestors and simply didn't have the, uh, some of these human capacities uh, because they were uh, re-emerging their ape uh, things. So here we see then within society there's this inequality and especially it had to do with the mentally ill and criminals. And by the way, psychiatrists were on the forefront of the eugenics movement. They were really one of the driving forces in the eugenics movement. But not only would it apply within society, it also applied across societies, especially dealing with race. Uh, we were just discussing over dinner uh, here about uh, Darwin's own ideas, and Darwin did uh, himself uh, believe in the inequality of races. Uh, however, Ernst Haeckel, the le leading Darwinist in Germany, was even more radically inegalitarian in his racial scheme. Here is a frontispiece to his uh, very popular book, uh, Natürliche Schöpfungsgeschichte, which means natural history of creation. Uh, and in that, he has 12 pictures here. And you notice the top one here is Indo-European. Uh, and then we have then uh, Asi Asians, Mon Mongol race, they called it at the time. Going down here to number six, uh, which is an African, a black African. And then notice number seven, then you start the primates. So these first six pictures here are of human uh, races, uh, these next ones are primate species. And the caption to this particular uh, illustration claimed that the distance between the highest human, that's number one here, and the lowest human, number six here, is higher, or bigger rather, than the distinction or difference between the lowest human and the highest primate. And notice how similar those are in facial features and such. The idea is here, these are real close and these are further apart. You have actually six steps to get to here, and then just one step to the primate uh, there. And he actually wrote that in the caption. In fact, uh, Heckel at one point uh, claimed that uh, the difference mentally between the lowest human and uh, the highest human was greater than the distance between the lowest human and even a dog or an elephant. He also divided, Heckel also divided the races, the human races into 12 species not only that, but he divided those 12 species into four distinct genera. So that's how inegalitarian he was in his racial uh, scheme. And this is not totally unusual. Heckel was extremely influential, for one thing, uh, and won a lot of people over to his ideas. But there were many uh, Darwinists uh, preaching similarly this racial inegalitarianism. And here's uh, an illustration to show that this hit the popular front as well. Here's a, a popular uh, magazine in Germany with some uh, German, this is during World War I, 1916. Here's some German uh, soldiers 
and they have captured a black African troop. The French used black Africans on the Western Front. Uh, and so here they've captured a black African troop. Uh, and they says, man, you're bringing him to Hagenbeck, aren't you? Hagenbeck was, a fam was very famous in Germany for uh, his zoo collections that he uh, made in many parts of Germany. He said, man, you're bringing him to Hagenbeck, aren't you? He can't catch better gorillas in Africa than we can on the Western Front. And so again, we see the, the dehumanizing aspect here of this inegalitarianism as it's being practiced. And it's being practiced both relating to uh, the races, but also toward individuals within uh, a particular society. Okay? Second point, in addition to human inequality, uh, we have moral relativism undermining human rights. And this is a prominent theme in many Darwinian thinkers uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, Darwin himself uh, admitted that this was uh, a consequence of his own views. In his autobiography, he wrote that one, quote, can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him the best ones. Now, to be sure, Darwin, with his Victorian optimism, uh, believed that the best and, and strongest instincts would be social instincts, as he called them, which would lead to the golden rule. He thought that morality was built into the human species, <clears throat> biologically, instinctually. And so he had optimism that this would lead to altruistic kind of behavior. But what if it didn't? What if someone had different instincts? <clears throat> Uh, he basically didn't have any leverage uh, morally uh, to tell them that you know, that was good or that was bad. It's just follow the instincts which are strongest and seem uh, the best ones. This was not an uncommon idea, once again. A, a famous uh, philosopher at the University of Vienna named Friedrich Jodl, who uh, edited the uh, International Journal of Ethics, a very prominent journal in his field. He's, so he's an internationally renowned ethicist. Likewise argued in an essay that because of Darwinism, morality was relative and changed over time, and therefore argued we needed to reform uh, morality and argued we needed social reform as a result of that. There are quite a number of thinkers, in fact, who argued against universal human rights uh, based on Darwinian ideology. Okay, that's my second point. My third point is the animal ancestry of humans was another key issue that was going to have big ethical implications relating to uh, human life. Darwin argued that the difference between uh, humans and their primate ancestors was a matter of degree, not of kind. It was, to use his words, he said it's a quantitative difference, not a qualitative difference. So this blurs the distinction then between uh, humans and uh, animals. And so you have here a, a picture that's in one of Ernst Haeckel's books. Uh, again, Haeckel plays a pretty prominent role in my study since he was the leading Darwinist in Germany and, and wrote a lot of best-selling works. Uh, in his 1911 edition of the same work that I pulled that frontispiece out of earlier, uh, he uh, has a, a piece here that shows an alleged uh, missionary, mission, missing link, rather, uh, of humans. So you see the sort of facial features there looking sort of half primate a half human there. This kind of thinking, by the way, has led today to ideas of uh, charges by animal rights activists of speciesism and such, because there's no clear line between species uh, for Darwin, and that includes humans and their closest uh, animal ancestors. Associated with uh, some of these ideas, uh, an idea that might not strike you at first until you think about it more would be the denial of body-soul dualism. Uh, Darwin himself was trying to bridge the gap between animals and humanity. Uh, and in doing that, Darwin wanted to explain all human faculties uh, as the product of purely natural processes. And the things that had been traditionally explained in his day as being part of the human soul or the human spirit, such as morality, uh, which again it plays a big role in my work, but also religion and other kinds of uh, functions, aesthetics. These things, Darwin wanted to explain them all as product of natural processes. And, and 
And many other Darwinists uh, agreed. In fact, uh, one of the most striking cases I found of this was August Forel, who was a world-renowned psychiatrist at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, who, uh, in his, as a young man, read Darwin's Origin of Species and immediately became convinced. In fact, he describes this in his autobiography in, in the terms of almost religious conversion experience, uh, that suddenly the lights went on and he understood uh, that there was no such thing as a human soul uh, and because of Darwin's theory. And he went out after that and uh, studied ants uh, and ant uh, social behavior and such, and then eventually became a psychiatrist, a leading psychiatrist in the world, and became uh, one of the leading figures in the eugenics movement, <clears throat> winning over one of some of the main uh, German eugenicists. <clears throat> uh, there were also many others uh, in the Darwinian camp who were struggling against uh, the idea of body-soul dualism. Ernst Haeckel, whom I've mentioned a number of times already, in 1906 founded an organization called the Monist League. And he called his philosophy monism. And what that was meant to do was be a direct uh, contradiction to dualism. And he fought against any kinds of dualism, Judeo-Christian most prominently, since that was the most uh, prominent worldview around in his day, but also against Kantian dualism, any kind of dualism uh, he was opposed to. And uh, he believed that his Darwinian outlook had destroyed the notion that there could be any kind of a human soul separate from uh, the body. OK, fifth point, uh, the human struggle for existence. This was another key aspect of Darwinian thinking that was going to have big implications uh, for the value of human life. Darwin had explained that uh, as, multi as uh, organisms multiply, they multiply far faster than they can survive. Uh, and this imbalance, which was based on uh, Malthus' population principle, Malthus had been a, a thinker who had posed the, a problem of, of the uh, super fecundity or the over-reproduction of uh, species, as, and Malthus focused specifically on humans. Uh, Darwin got his idea about struggle for existence and natural selection while reading Malthus, and then had to explain this situation where you have all these uh, organisms being produced but not reaching reproductive age, which means there's mass death taking place throughout the biological world. And Malthus, of course, was specifically talking about human society, so certainly this is applying to humans uh, as well. Now, this idea of the human struggle for existence, competition for scarce resources, because there's more people reproducing than can possibly exist according to Malthus and then also according to Darwin, could also take place on two levels, just like the inequality issue. It can take place, the struggle for existence can take place within a society. So people within a society, individuals, are having to struggle among themselves uh, and have scarce resources. So the way this worked itself out, here's a eugenics poster uh, from Germany. I think this was done during the Nazi period, in fact. And the title of it is The Threat of the Subhuman. And there on the top, you have uh, these, uh, this is a, a male criminal, it says. And the male criminal has 4.9 children. And then here you have a criminal marriage, it says, 4.4 children. Then here you have in this middle diagram, you have uh, parents uh, with uh, children in special education. Okay? And they have 3.5 children with them. And then down here you have the average German family. And they're having 2.2 children. And here you have an academic family. Uh, and they only have 1.9 children. And the lesson is that in this struggle for existence, the wrong people are winning out. Uh, it's the, the criminals and the mentally, quote, substandard are the ones who are winning out in the struggle for existence. So we need to rectify this situation. Uh, and the eugenics was the way to try to rectify uh, this situation for many of these Darwinian thinkers. OK, uh, here's another one. Uh, it's not just Germany that this is going on. Here's one from the United States. Uh, this is a display that was uh, put in many uh, fairs throughout the United States. The Amer American Eugenics Society had booths at, at uh, county and state fairs throughout the United States in the early 20th century, 
where they pushed for their ideas relating to population. And you see here on the left, it says some people are born to be a burden on the rest. And then here below it, it says America needs, and then it says less of these, and it has here on the left a light blinking. Uh, it says that light blinks every 48 seconds on the left. And it says every 48 seconds a person is born in the United States who will never grow up mentally beyond that stage of a normal eight-year-old boy or girl. Okay, So we need less of those. And then on the right side, it says America needs more of these. And here you have a light flashing. It says this light flashes every seven and a half minutes. And it says every seven and a half minutes, a high-grade person is born in the United States who will have ability to do creative work and be fit for leadership. About 4% of all Americans come within this class. Now notice the disparity here. Okay, on the left, you have every 48 seconds. Here, it's only every seven and a half minutes. Again, this is designed to generate your fears of human degeneration that's going to take place uh, because more of these, quote, unfit people are being born than of the so-called fit. Okay, so again, a similar kind of idea. Notice again the inegalitarianism here, which we already talked about earlier, uh, people being a burden on the right, trying to figure out how to correct uh, these kind of problems that they have. Okay, so that's within society. That's how the human struggle for existence would take place within society. But then human struggle for existence also takes place between societies. Uh, here's a uh, diagram from a book by a man named Friedrich Helwald, who was a uh, prominent German ethnologist who uh, wrote a book called uh, cult The History of Culture. Uh, this is from the fourth edition in 1896. Uh, his first edition was in the 1870s. Uh, and he was uh, highly regarded by uh, his colleagues. Uh, but his whole account of the history of culture is an attempt to try to show how the Darwinian struggle for existence applies to human history. And this he gives as one example. And he says in the text that this is an example of the human struggle for existence. The Spaniards up here are letting their dogs loose on the American Indians. And Helvalt says, this is just a natural process that takes place. It's just part of the human struggle for existence. And so thus justifies this kind of scene as he depicts it here. Now, Helvot was not the only one to put forward ideas similar to this. In fact, Darwin himself put forward ideas about racial extermination. Darwin wrote to a colleague saying that, quote, the more civilized so-called Caucasian races have beaten the Turkish hollow in the struggle for existence. Looking to the world at no very distant date, what an endless number of the lower races will have been eliminated by the higher civilized races throughout the world. He also said in The Descent of Man, so in a published work, quote, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. This was a very prominent and fairly common idea among uh, Darwinists and thinking about their inegalitarianism and then the struggle for existence resulting in extermination and death for those uh, who were considered unfit or less fit. Okay, my sixth point then. That was the human struggle for existence now, sixth point. Darwinism viewed death in a whole new way uh, than had a traditional, certainly traditional Judeo-Christian thought. Darwinism saw death as producing progress. After all, the human struggle for existence is producing greater complexity uh, in <clears throat> organisms. And so he saw death as being an engine driving the, the evolutionary progress. Uh, and although Darwin, by the way, some note that Darwin didn't really believe in teleology, and there are times when he says he doesn't uh, believe in his work, uh, promotes the idea of progress. But actually, he uses words of progress throughout uh, The Origin of Species and Descent of Man. And just one quote uh, that I think illustrates this, in The Origin of Species, Darwin says, thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. This, by the way, is a secular theodicy. 
Theodicy means a justification of evil, a, ju a justification of God in the face of evil. Of course, it's a secular one because it's pushing God out of the picture, but it's justifying natural evil by claiming that a higher good gets produced by natural evil uh, in the world. This was a very common idea as well. Uh, Friedrich Helwald, who I just showed you the slide on with his uh, history of culture, uh, said in that history of culture that humans, quote, the, the fitter humans, rather, quote, stride across the corpses of the vanquished. That is natural law. Okay, so here we have a scientific justification for uh, the death of the vanquished in this human struggle for existence. Now, this took place not only in terms of racial extermination, which I've just talked a little bit about, but it also took place on other levels. There were quite a number of Darwinian thinkers in the late 19th and early 20th century who used Darwinian thinking to justify abortion, to justify infanticide. I already mentioned uh, Ernst Haeckel there, and also euthanasia. And in these two books uh, that came out fairly recently, uh, the first one on the top there by Ian Dowbiggin, uh, he's at the University of Prince Edward Island. His book, A Merciful End, The Euthanasia Movement in Modern America. And then also Nick Kemp, Merciful Release, The History of the British Euthanasia Movement. I should say, too, that these two guys ideologically are poles apart. Uh, Dow Biggin's a little skeptical toward euthanasia, whereas Kemp is very uh, supportive of euthanasia. Uh, both of them admit that Darwinism was a key point in the conversion of people toward euthanasia and were that leaders in the early, early euthanasia movement uh, in America and in Britain uh, were very influenced by Darwinian thinking. Dowbiggin said this, quote, the most pivotal turning point in early history of the euthanasia movement was the coming of Darwinism to America. So he said that was the most important point in ideologically in winning people over to euthanasia. Uh, Nick Kemp largely agrees with that assessment, saying, quote, while we should be wary of depicting Darwin as the man responsible for ushering in a secular age, we should be similarly cautious of underestimating the importance of evolutionary thought in relation to the questioning of the sanctity of human life. So again, admitting that this is an extremely important part in, in stripping away the sanctity of human life was the Darwinian uh, uh, theory and uh, subsequent worldviews that were uh, being built upon it. Now, I think the importance of this uh, perhaps goes without saying in many ways. Uh, in my own work, I've looked at how this has led into Nazi ideology. And in fact, as I told you at the beginning, I wasn't really even thinking about Hitler when I began my study. It's only as I began studying some of these eugenicists and what they had to say about the value of human life that I even began to to think about Hitler and to realize that, yeah, what Hitler was saying is very close to what some of these other people have been saying that I've been studying here. So here, just to give you one quote, uh, is, there is a place in humanity for murder, that is to say, by killing the unfit. Sounds a lot like Nazi ideology. Next one. Chloroform unfit children. Show them the same mercy that has shown beasts that are no longer fit to live. That sounds a lot like Nazi ideology, but these guys weren't Nazis that wrote this. The top quotation is from Havelock Ellis, who was a prominent physician and sex reformer, a progressive uh, in early 20th century Britain, and wrote quite widely on sex reform <clears throat> at the time. And eugenics, by the way, was an ideology that was not the province of the right wing, as sometimes it's been caricatured. Uh, eugenics ideology was very, uh, and scholars acknowledge this pretty much across the board, was very uh, popular with the left as well and progressives. In fact, the very earliest eugenicists were themselves progressives. Some of them called themselves socialists uh, even, or at least were sympathetic with socialism. Uh, but not with the, I should say, not with Marxism because they weren't egalitarian. This second one here about chloroform the unfit children, this comes from Clarence Darrow, the American uh, who was the defense attorney at the Scopes, famous Scopes trial relating to Darwinism. He was defending Darwinism at the Scopes trial uh, there. And he was also then a prominent uh, supporter of uh, infanticide and euthanasia based on his uh, Darwinian thinking. And again, notice the word unfit is in both of those uh, quotations as well, showing the connections there with uh, the Darwinian kind of thinking. 
Now, I think what this has to do with Hitler is probably fairly obvious. I don't need to spend a lot of time on it. If you want to read more about it, the last chapter of my book talks about Hitler and his ideas. In fact, the last chapter is called Hitler's Ethic, which is not an oxymoron, by the way. A lot of people think that, that does, that's sort of contradictory, Hitler's ethic. In fact, I actually gave a talk one time at a university where I, was, I, I laid out the table of contents for my book. And the last chapter on Hitler's ethic, one, one of the uh, persons in the audience in question and answer time quipped and said, well, I guess that last uh, chapter is going to be kind of thin, huh? <laughs> and I said, oh, on the contrary. I think Hitler did have some very coherent, albeit pernicious, uh, moral views. And in fact, uh, very interestingly, the very day that I sent my manuscript off to the, my publisher, the very final manuscript last July, I received an email from someone telling me about a work uh, by Claudia Kuntz at Duke University with Harvard University Press that just came out called The Nazi Conscience. Uh, and her work, in fact, corroborates a lot of what I say about Hitler and his particular views, at least that he has a coherent ethic. She doesn't argue for the Darwinian uh, angle, uh, however. She doesn't really talk about the antecedents at all. So my work actually fits uh, together kind of nicely with hers, uh, in fact. But I think what it has to do with Nazis is pretty obvious. But here's a Nazi poster uh, to sort of make a little more explicit here what we're talking about. This Nazi poster sounds a lot like uh, the one I showed you earlier with the American eugenics uh, society at the fairs and such. 60,000 marks is what this mentally ill person costs the national community in a lifetime. Comrades, this is your money, too. And uh, once uh, the Nazis came to power in uh, July 1933, just six months after they came to power, they passed a law of compulsory sterilization for those who were considered mentally or physically handicapped, especially those who were institutionalized. Uh, and they uh, carried this program on extremely vigorously, sterilizing several hundred thousand. In fact, they sterilized half the population, uh, excuse me, half a percent of the population of Germany was sterile, compulsorily sterilized in their sterilization program. Then when World War II broke out, they began a so-called euthanasia program. Now, but this was not voluntary euthanasia. This was the murder of the mentally and physically handicapped who were institutionalized, which began in October 1939 and was carried out in six uh, killing centers located throughout Germany in which they killed about 70,000 mentally and physically, mostly mentally, but also some physically handicapped uh, people. Uh, and this is considered by many scholars the uh, first step of the Holocaust. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a, a book called The Origins of the Nazi Holocaust uh, by uh, Henry Friedlander, in which he argues that the euthanasia campaign was the opening salvo in uh, the Nazi Holocaust. <clears throat> There was a close connection between these eugenics ideas and his racial ideas. The inequality was simply on a different level there. But you might ask then, OK, you know, these ideas were around in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, we see that Hitler bought into ideas of, about social Darwinism and such. But didn't the demise of Nazism uh, bring about a death or deal a death blow to uh, eugenics ideology, to ideas about racial extermination, Darwinian racism, uh, and such. Yes, in many ways it did. Uh, the word eugenics itself uh, came into disrepute uh, after the Nazi period, partly because of what the Nazis did. That wasn't the only factor, but it was one important one. But nonetheless, Darwinian devaluing of human life continued to occur uh, simply in different kinds of ways. And now I want to jump just a little bit uh, and move on to contemporary, the contemporary scene to show you that this is not just something uh, that was taking place uh, back uh, 50 to 100 years ago, but it's something that's still an issue today. First of all, oops, wrong one. Here we go. Peter Singer. Peter Singer is a very prominent uh, philosopher. He's at Princeton University now. He's from Australia. Uh, and interestingly, uh, he, his parents fled the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, but he's been accused very often of uh, having uh, Nazi kind of ideas because of his uh, devaluing of human life. Now notice on the left uh, book there, the Darwinian left, I was trying to bring up something here to illustrate that Singer is very committed to Darwinian ideology. Uh, and he believes that uh, the left 
or the progressives need to incorporate Darwinian thinking uh, into their uh, political ideologies, and that's what that book uh, is about. But then on the right, you see his book, Rethinking Life and Death, and this is more of what Singer is actually known for. Singer is known for his bioethics, uh, and particularly his stance favoring voluntary euthanasia, as well as infanticide uh, for infants uh, who have uh, mental and physical handicaps of various sort. Now, Singer does draw a very direct correlation between Darwinism and the uh, sanctity of human life, or I should say the undermining of the sanctity of human life. Singer uh, claims in one of his essays, in a, it's not in either of these books actually, it's in a different book, uh, but he argues that Darwinism, quote, gave what ought to have been its final blow, quote closed, to the sanctity of life ethic. So he says Darwinism should have uh, destroyed Judeo-Christian idea of the sanctity of human life. Now he admits that it hasn't. It's Judeo-Christian sanctity of human life ethic is still persisting, but he wants to give it the death blow now uh, through his philosophy. Uh, Singer not only promotes uh, infanticide and voluntary euthanasia, he's also very strongly into animal rights, uh, which is uh, also part of uh, the issue of speciesism that I mentioned earlier, the blurring of the distinctions between the human species and other animals fits right in uh, to that. Now, Singer's not alone. Uh, there are many other thinkers also who are uh, promoting, uh, Singer, I should say, is one of the more radical of them, but there are also many other thinkers that are promoting similar kinds of ideas about uh, Darwinism and its connections to uh, the devaluing of human life. This one by Daniel Dennett, who's a prominent uh, materialist philosopher in the United States. Uh, his uh, book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Evolution and the Meanings of Life. In that book, he argues that Darwinism acts like a universal acid, dissolving uh, all other ideologies, all other uh, ideas, especially religion. Uh, and also ethical ideas, though. And he does spend a good deal of time, deal of time talking about ethics uh, in that uh, book, although there are a lot of other issues that he raises uh, as well. In his talking about ethics, he does uh, briefly discuss the issue of the value of human life. It's not a major theme in the book, but it does get discussed. And he says that there are, quote, gradations of value in the ending of human lives. Well, if there are gradations of value and ending of human lives, this also implies, at least to me, that there are gradations of value of human life. And in fact, he goes on to say, uh, in thinking about sort of concrete steps here, he goes on to ask, which is worse, taking heroic measures to keep alive a severely deformed infant, or taking the equally heroic, if unsung, step of seeing to it that such an infant dies as quickly and painlessly as possible. Okay, so again, here is a uh, not very veiled uh, promotion of infanticide for uh, children that have some kind of deformity of sorts. So again, we have a similar kind of idea uh, percolating here in Daniel Dennett's book. And so apparently, Darwin's dangerous idea is especially dangerous to the mentally and physically handicapped. And that universal acid apparently eats away at them most. Okay, let me stop there for a second. Okay, another uh, key figure today uh, is Richard Dawkins. He's probably one of the most famous Darwinists in the world today at Oxford University. Uh, in an article in 2001, and there are many other places I could look for this too, but I thought was, this one was especially interesting. In 2001, he wrote an article uh, in which he advocated genetic engineering to try to produce uh, a missing link, if you will. He wanted to try to produce something as close to an Australopithecine as possible uh, to get back. He, he, call, he even called her a, a Lucy. Okay, so he wants to get back to a missing link. Now, why would he want to do that? And in fact, he even says he sort of uh, thinks that maybe he would feel sorry for such an individual, uh, such a, uh, a, an organism. I don't know what he would call it. Uh, sort of half human, half uh, animal, I suppose. He said he would sort of feel sorry for him because it would probably be uh, put in shows and such uh, and be shown off. But he said he nonetheless thinks it would be a great idea to do it because 
He says he thinks that it would help destroy our speciesist illusion. And the speciesist illusion is the idea that there is a significant distinction and difference between humans and other animals. And so he says, if we could bring on this missing link, if we could produce it genetically, figure out genetically what that must have been, you know, try to track that back, produce it through genetic engineering, then we can show the fallacy of, the different, of any kind of uh, sanctity of human life. In that same essay, I should uh, remark also that Dawkins also expressed the desire that if he ever got, quote, past it, that he would be euthanized. And some people probably think Dawkins has already passed it. Uh, but fortunately, I hope at least that most of those also believe in the sanctity of human life, and so they won't uh, help him out in his uh, request. Oh, but there are many others, uh, and I could go on and on here, but uh, maybe just suffice it for one more uh, example, contemporary example, and that's James Watson. Again, he's the most famous geneticist around today. He uh, discovered, co-discovered the uh, helix model of DNA back in 1953 uh, with Crick. Uh, he uh, then became a head of the Human Genome Project when it was uh, started in the early 90s, 89 to 90. Uh, and has had a huge impact on the field of genetics. He builds his worldview very forthrightly on uh, Darwinian naturalism. I don't know if any of you saw Watson in the PBS special on genetics that was out like in January, I think, but he talks quite extensively about uh, Darwinism and the way that it undermines the idea of design uh, and such. He makes, in fact, quite a number of startling statements uh, in that. Uh, Watson uh, has never learned to mind his mouth, has never been known for his uh, uh, tact. He's created a lot of enemies that way, uh, too. But Watson proposes a new eugenics. He doesn't use that word very often. The word eugenics is still a little bit too much disrepute. A lot of times people say new genetics instead of eugenics. But they, he, actually, the word eugenics is actually uh, getting a little bit of a comeback in the last few years. Uh, and people are beginning to be less abashed about using the term eugenics in contemporary discourse. Uh, and he very forthrightly argues for human inequality uh, and biological inequality uh, in that uh, PBS special that focuses on him and his ideas about uh, new eugenics. And they're talking about different aspects of human genetic engineering and such to try to um, get rid of. And by the way, there's a really interesting clip, by the way, in that PBS special where uh, Watson is talking about, he says, the lower 10% of people in, in elementary school. And he's talking about how they are inferior. He doesn't use the word inferior, but that's the point that he's making there. And he actually says, as he's going through that, talking about these 10% of people, he says, you know, we need to find a way to get rid of, uh, well, I mean, to help out these people who are in the lower 10%. And when I, when I heard that, he sort of stumbles over it a little bit. And I actually had to replay that about 10 times to really listen to exactly what he said and how he said it. And he really does say we need to get rid of, and then he, I forgot what the exact next two words are, but he sort of stumbles a little bit. And then he says, uh, help out those who are in this lower uh, 10%. But if you listen to the rest of the video, he's talking very forthrightly about, quote, getting rid of those with uh, various kinds of physical and mental uh, hereditary uh, illnesses. Well, in 1973, before we had a lot of the genetic technologies we have, especially diagnostic technologies, Watson actually proposed that we uh, allow parents to kill their infants after birth uh, because we couldn't figure out at that time, and you'll see this in the very top part of this, I've got the slide up here. Uh, Watson said in 1973, because of the present limits of such detection methods, meaning of genetic illnesses, well, now he doesn't have that problem because they can detect a lot of them. Uh, not all of them, of course, but they can detect a lot of them now. So you could do, you can, he's pushing abortion very strongly now. But at this time, he said, because of the present limits of such detection methods, most birth defects are not discovered until birth. If a child were not declared alive until three days after birth, then all parents could be allowed the choice. There's that word choice again. Uh, we hear so much in our society. <clears throat> the doctor could allow the child to die if the parents so choose and save a lot of misery and suffering. <clears throat> OK, let me close by considering the question then. In light of all of this, does Darwinism really devalue human life? I think I've shown conclusively that historically, 
Darwinism has indeed devalued human life, leading to ideologies that promote uh, the destruction of human lives deemed less valuable or unfit. Those on the forefront in, pr in promoting abortion, which I haven't talked about much tonight, but if you look back at the early abortion movement, you see Darwinian arguments cropping up uh, quite strongly as well. Ernst Haeckel made arguments for abortion based on, uh, matter of fact, let me mention that real quick because I think that's a really interesting one. Ernst Haeckel argued that from conception, uh, a uh, person is a distinct human individual. But he was, promo he was promoting infanticide even. So he said that because they were still going through lower stages of evolutionary development in their earlier embryonic stages, it was OK then uh, to abort them, especially if they were uh, possibly going to have some genetic or hereditary would be the word at that time, hereditary illness. But those in the forefront promoting abortion, uh, infanticide, euthanasia, and racial extermination often overtly base their ideas on Darwinism. Also, as I've shown here, those favoring a Darwinian dismantling of the sanctity of life ethic do have a good deal of intellectual firepower, both uh, then and today. Uh, and the idea is becoming uh, rather widespread in our society, as well as other parts of Western culture. There are, of course, various uh, religious and philosophical moves that someone could make to evade these conclusions. And some Darwinists have in the past, and some still do today, uh, vigorously oppose these kinds of developments of devaluing human life. And for this, we can be thankful. Uh, they construe them often as faulty extrapolations by overzealous Darwinian materialists, perhaps. However, it still does seem to me that there is uh, some kind of inherent logic in the move that these Darwinists are making in undermining the sanctity of life ethic. And if you think about those six points that I raised, I think there is a certain kind of logic to that, whether one, wants, whether one agrees with that uh, move or not, that does make this a very alluring uh, view. And so I really doubt that this kind of uh, view of Darwinian devaluing, uh, excuse me, of devaluing human life is going to disappear as long as Darwinism is ascendant. Because Darwinism has such profound implications for our views of humans and what it means to be human, and human nature, life, and death, it seems to me implausible to maintain that Darwinism can be fully disentangled from ethics or religion. In fact, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, who passed away recently but was one of the most uh, prominent Darwinian biologists or paleontologists uh, in the world, uh, argued that Darwinism uh, and science on the one hand and religion and ethics on the other hand are completely separate, totally divorced, having nothing to do with each other. He called this his view of the non-overlapping magisteria. So they don't overlap at all in any way. But even he failed to keep them apart when he actually, when push came to shove and when he began uh, writing. Uh, in his book, just to give one example, he has a book out called Wonderful Life, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History. And in that work, uh, Gould argues for the contingency of history, that is, chance events drive history. It's not programmed in. As a matter of fact, he specifically says that if you replayed the tape of life, humans probably wouldn't exist. The closing words of his book, however, show that he wasn't really able to keep things separate the way that he thought he could. Uh, let me read to you just one, the very closing words to Wonderful Life. And so, if you wish to ask the question of the ages, why do humans exist? A major part of the answer, touching those aspects of the issue that science can treat at all, must be because Pykaia, which is a Burgess Shale chordate that he talks about in the book, because Pykaia survived the Burgess decimation. This response does not cite a single law of nature, it embodies no statement about predictable evolutionary pathways, no calculation of probabilities based on general rules of anatomy or ecology. Uh, he goes on, the survival of Pykaia was a contingency of just history. I do not think that any higher answer can be given, and I cannot imagine that any resolution could be more fascinating. We are the offspring of history and must establish our own paths in this most diverse and interesting of conceivable universes, one indifferent to our suffering, and therefore offering us maximal freedom to thrive or to fail in our chosen way." Now that is just dripping 
with religious and ethical content. And he's claiming that he's drawing it from science, from the contingency of history. In fact, the very title of his book uh, that tells us the Burgess Shale and the nature of history should give us a clue that he is making a philosophical argument here uh, that goes way beyond uh, what uh, science, at least his version of science, just tell me the facts, uh, should be able to give us, especially given his own view that science and ethics don't overlap at all. Whatever one's stance on Darwinism, then, I think it's certainly safe to say that Darwinism has had a tremendous influence on ethical and moral ideas in the modern world. Specifically, it has contributed to the erosion of the sanctity of life ethic. And I'd close by saying that Darwinism really is a matter of life and death. Thank you. Uh, we're going we're gonna to move now into um, a time of question and answer. Um, and our only request is that you come up to the mics um, when you answer your question or when you ask your questions so that um, the professor can hear you and so that we can get it on the tape. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if, I was kind of um, wondering what you thought the sanctity of your sanctity of life was prior to Darwinism. And if you're saying that um, that these things originated, that these new ideas and sanctity of life originated from Darwin, then how is it different to prior to Darwinism? Because I'm an anthropology major, and in my studies here at UC, UCSB, I've kind of been um, told that this was a pro that Darwin came out of a, progress a progression of thought, starting with anything as, as early as Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what you thought Darwinism changed, or if it was more of a development from early thought. Well, I don't want to get too far afield into the Greek philosophy issue, because of course, uh, Judeo-Christian thinking supplanted a lot of Greek thought and undermined a lot of Greek thought. And one of the ways that it did that was by um, having strict prohibitions against the killing of innocent human life. Now, of course, this was not always honored uh, as anything. You know, we can go back historically and find examples of infanticide, find examples of uh, unjust war, even though they had just war theory to try to justify, to try to figure out when would be innocent human life. Uh, certainly the Christian tradition uh, throughout uh, medieval, early modern times, up and through the 19th century, and even a lot of conservative uh, groups still today, uh, have stood very staunchly against abortion against suicide of any kind uh, and against euthanasia. There's a very good book, in fact, by Ed Larson and Daryl Amundsen called A Different Death, which looks at euthanasia and suicide in the Christian tradition, and he answers this question. In the 19th century, there was a key shift because uh, with Darwin, and it wasn't just Darwinism, and, I'm not, and I don't want to try to imply, too, that it's just Darwinism doing all of this. Darwinism was both a uh, consequence and a cause of some of these developments that were taking place. He was a product of some of the secularizing tendencies of his age, for example. Uh, but then he also gave some very prominent uh, impetus towards some of that secularization as well. So you've sort of got a cycle going there. But in the mid to late 19th century was the first time publicly that anyone uh, in Western culture, with the possible exception of Thomas More, He's debatable. Some people debate whether his particular passage was meant in earnest or how exactly he meant his passage in Utopia. But with the possible exception of Thomas More, in the mid-19th century was the first time that people actually proposed killing uh, mentally handicapped infants, for example. Uh, abortion, strictly prescribed. And you look at the legal codes of Europe, too. It, it, it follows right down. Abortion was legally prescribed in every European country. Uh, throughout, the, uh, up until the early 20th century and even into the mid 20th century most places and such. So the idea of killing an innocent human being, whether through abortion, whether through infanticide, whether through, uh, whether through euthanasia or suicide, strictly prescribed. And of course it wasn't always obeyed, but it was part of the moral code. Does okay. that help? Um, well, I also was wondering if you're familiar with the name Carrie Buck. Yes, certainly. Um, do you know of yeah. any other um, examples of eugenics that are more modern than um, the 
early Victorian era, like more in the well, 1970s? Carrie Buck was in the 1920s. Was it? Okay. Yeah, Carrie Buck was the, was the uh, person who was involved in the famous, uh, the Supreme Court case, in fact, that was uh, about compulsory sterilization in 1927, Buck versus Bell. Uh, and Carrie Buck uh, was compulsorily sterilized uh, because she had a, a child out of wedlock uh, it was claimed that child was unfit and that she was herself mentally unstable and such. Uh, in fact, the compulsory sterilization was going on in Scandinavia up until the 1970s. There were some states in the United States that it was still going on in the 50s and 60s, uh, but it was pretty much dying down after the 30s and especially the 40s. Uh, China is the one country today that still has, or re recently implemented in fact, a, a eugenics law, 1995. Uh, China passed a eugenics law which fits tightly with their population policy because they have one child policy and so they want to make sure it's quality. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, I couldn't help but notice that uh, even though a concept of Darwinism was interwoven throughout your entire presentation that you did not de define what Darwinism was to begin with. Um, so that's my question. Uh, how would you define it? Darwinism is uh, common and descent with modifications uh, through uh, of organisms uh, through natural selection, uh, being driven by the Malth I did talk about the Malthusian population principle and the struggle for existence, and those are in, uh, vital ingredients, of course, of Darwinism. Okay. So I mean, evolution through natural selection. I mean, I, I don't know if I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I'm a biology major. I have a strong how scientific would you, how background. Would you, how would you define Darwinism then? Uh, Dar I, I, would, I would explain Darwinism as uh, a mechanism by which adaptive evolution occurs, uh, which results from the interaction of random genetic change with uh, chance environmental change. Okay. Uh, part, of the, part of the problem with your definition, part of the problem with your definition, though, uh, which is correct, your definition is correct, but part of the problem with your definition, the reason I wouldn't use that in my talk here, is because I'm a historian and no one knew some of those things that you're saying until the 1930s and 40s. Some of the things you said would only have been part of the well, neo-Darwinian would only with, be part of the neo-Darwinian synthesis. I mean, okay. Dar Darwin himself didn't. The vast majority of my research was pre-1920. Okay, so they weren't operating with that definition. So for me to define Darwinism that way, I'd, I wouldn't even be talking about the people I'm talking about because they didn't know that definition. Okay, but then do you, do you not think it would be beneficial to then come back post hoc and integrate what modern biologists have, have come to realize about evolutionary biology? Well, modern biologists still basically do use the same basic principles here. They've just added on to it the layer. They, they know now about genetics, which Darwin didn't know anything of about. Of okay. So they still basically be in natural selection uh, through the struggle for existence, through the Population imbalance, that's still all part of Darwinian, of course, of course, Darwinian of thinking. Course, sure. They've just added on to it the layer of the genetic variation that you were talking about. Okay. Here and through random. And Darwin did use random, by the way, Darwin's idea is based upon largely random change, although Darwin hedged on that. Uh, he did say Lamarckism could have some impact, use, disuse. He talked yeah, about other things that could he have happened. Straight away from so, that. But, but he, did basically per, he did basically say it was mostly chance. He didn't have any explanation for variation. And, and I guess the same answer would apply toward a biological definition of fitness. That, I mean, where biologists pre-1930s or 40s who, who didn't understand genetics and inheritance um, were obviously using a very different definition of fitness um, than what a modern biologist would. I don't know. If you look at James, uh, if you look at James Watson's uh, video on genetics, uh, his talking about fitness uh, reminds me a lot of the eugenicists in the early 20th century, how did, how did in fact. Uh, well, he didn't actually define it, but he uses the term uh, and talks about the inferiority of the different people and such. And, and basically, the idea, which is, of course, technically wrong, and every Darwinist should have known it was wrong, but they were still using it. Even in, even in the 19th century, they should have known it was wrong. The idea that the unfit are, are outstripping the fit is impossible. Because by definition, the ones who are surviving and reproducing are the fit ones. No, the ones by definition who are reproducing only are the fit ones. That, that is the biological definition of fitness. Right, that's what I just How many, uh, but you right. said surviving. I mean, you can survive all you want, not reproduce. You're correct. Your I said zero. survive and reproduce. You have to survive right. to reproduce. Okay. okay. So okay. survive and reproduce. Right. Okay. Exactly. 
So they are, by definition, the most fit. So when you have this, this eugenics poster where they show the, uh, you know, where they show the, uh, uh, you know, the criminal out reproducing the academic, what that means is that the criminal is more fit. Right, but then they, but then, but then I, I disagree with the use of the term fitness for when they integrate, say, the criminal's offspring, and they say, oh, by default, of those offspring being offspring of a criminal, they are by default less fit. Mm -hmm. Well, their fitness is zero because they've had having any kids. I agree. Okay. Right. Okay. Great. Yeah, I agree with you. I think they're using it wrong. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's a good, a good intro to the question I was going to ask, and it mm -hmm. kind of asks the first half of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering about the fundamental contradiction of uh, eugenicists and Darwinism. Um, but I'm kind of wondering, like, at what point you mentioned Moore? At what point? Uh, eugenics, um, that thought decided that, it, because that's very intentional selection, and then mm -hmm. Darwinism being natural selection, like, so that's kind of a contradiction right there. Right. And then I was just kind of wondering, um, like, so uh, eugenics is sort of like an intentional selection, which seems to contradict that natural right. selection. Um, so I, I guess that I was thinking that possibly the turning point may have been um, people who are pro-eugenics th are thinking that um, at some point humanity started to aid the weak too much right. and sort of promoted this, you know, mm -hmm. um, taking care of the handicapped and things like that. Um, so there, there's a necessary need to step in and practice eugenics. Um, but I guess then that makes me think further that uh, a Darwinist argument would be that, um, that throughout, throughout uh, history, um, this should have been taking place of, of uh, you know, sort of the strong surviving and, and mm -hmm. uh, us killing off the weak. Um, but that's not really what you see, you know, throughout the course of history. I, I, I mean, even, I, I, think in, I, I think that that sort of speaks to our dualist nature, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the body-soul the body mm -hmm. separation. So how would, a, how would someone who's uh, pro-eugenics respond to that? Um, just to the idea that mankind throughout their history is sort of taken care of, um, specifically like family members and things like that. A couple of things. For one thing, Darwin, I should say, first of all, that Darwin himself did not promote eugenics. His cousin Galton, he knew well, he was well aware of Galton and the work that Galton was doing. Galton did actually drive Darwin more to biological determinism, but Darwin said that both basically natural selection could take care of the problem without the help of artificial selection. So Darwin himself didn't buy in that way. And you're right, you don't have to go in that direction. Uh, the fact that eugenicists did go in that direction and, and claimed it was based on Darwin was exactly like you're saying, that because trying to get rid of the unfit. What they were claiming was that modern civilization had produced new kinds of ways of the, quote, less fit. And when they said less fit, they were usually meaning uh, those that were physically or mentally less capable, and especially mentally uh, mm -hmm. less intellectual, and such, uh, especially the mentally ill and such. Uh, they were saying that in our modern society, we're actually taking care of them much better. Even 100 years ago, they would have died out mm -hmm. before they reproduced. But now we're helping them along. And in fact, it even got to the point, believe me, it even got to the point that they were talking about because of dentists. We now have, you know, we're selecting for people that uh, have cavities, uh, basically. And, and glasses are allowing us to select for people that don't have, uh, that can't see. Whereas before, they wouldn't have made it. And so the idea was that as modern culture has uh, gained all these new kinds of things to allow people to function better, uh, it's also then allowed the biological deterioration to come in. So it did lead to some of the craze of that. That's interesting that, that the, uh, I don't know, the, the progression that allows people to practice eugenics is, can be used, but the progression that allows us to practice modern medicine to keep people alive is argued against through Darwinism. Darwinism. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. In fact, what, what underpinned a lot of that, too, if we think about sort of the, what was behind all of that, is many of these eugenicists were arguing quite forthrightly against humanitarian ethics. I mean, it's a very forthright argument. It's not something that I'm reading into it. It's something that they themselves were claiming that we need to get rid of Judeo-Christian ethics because it emphasizes equality, because it emphasizes the sanctity of life. We need to get away from those ideas uh, so that we can then... Uh, improve the human species. Great, thank you. Sure. Um, 
It seems that I greatly appreciate that you were approaching the Darwinist arguments through their own mindset. And um, it seems that through all the implications that Darwinism does devalue human life. Mm -hmm. However, I'm curious as to the Darwinian response to that, because it seems to me that the response would be something like, so what, um, unfortunately. And I'm just wondering how people's reactions to your work, and especially uh, um, in modern day society. Well, the Darwinian reaction that's going to vary depending on what their own particular ethical or religious standpoint is. Uh, people like Peter Singer would probably be very glad for my work, <laughs> unfortunately, because he'll say, yeah, look, lots of people have had this idea. They must be right. You know, it must show that I'm right. You know, I'm on the right track. Uh, so I think some Darwinists who devalue human life would probably uh, agree fairly wholeheartedly with the kind of thing I think. Where I'm probably going to receive the most flack is probably going to be from those who want to uh, synthesize Darwinism with some kind of ethical or religious viewpoint. Uh, so I'm probably going to get the biggest flack from people who would be maybe theistic evolutionists or something like that who aren't going to want to, to uh, see those things uh, brought together. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions? the time, and it's getting late. This is going to be the last question. So. Thanks. Um, so you've mostly been discussing history. So I have a question that's more of your opinion. Um, I, I agree with most of what you say, that people probably shouldn't take their morals from evolution. Um, so what are, you, what, what are you implying? Take that a step further. What should we do about that? Well, certainly I don't get my morals from science or from the natural world, but I get my morals from the creator of the natural world, who is, I think, the only one who can uh, provide a moral foundation and framework for us to live in. So I would say look to Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, um, in my opinion, I think it's equally bad to take your morals from a myth uh, such as any god. And also, people could give a number of talks such as Muhammad to the suicide bombers and Jesus Christ to the Crusades to any number of killers. That's true. And, you know, in thinking about my particular topic and theme, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of antagonists to Christianity, of course, uh, do speak quite often about the Crusades, the uh, Inquisition and such when you're thinking about Christianity. And, of course, that is a blot on Christianity. But I would say go back to the original person. Go back to Jesus himself and see what he said. Uh, he didn't preach that. Okay, well, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all for having me here. Appreciate it. Oh, you want one more? Okay, just a real quick question. Um, I, I've read that there was a great deal of uh, 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 sort of a relationship between American eugenicists and the uh, Nazi eugenicists, and I was wondering if you got into that in your book. I don't really talk about it a lot. If you're talking about Edwin Black's book, is that what you're referring to? Is uh, you know, I haven't read that yet, but I've read some reviews, and I, I, I read a few articles that talked about the relationship. Yeah, Daniel Kevlis in the New York Review of Books, in fact, gave him a pretty negative review for the very same reason I think that I would have some qualms with it. I think Black's book probably does have some good points to it, uh, but I think he overplays the way that those connections work themselves out. And, and my book does have a bearing on that question, but it, I don't approach it directly. For one thing, I hadn't read Black's book when I... His book wasn't even out when mine was going to press. Uh, but basically what Black argues is Black argues that uh, the American eugenics movement basically produced the Nazi eugenics movement. Well, my book's going to blow that out of the water because I show that these German eugenicists were already saying these same things before uh, the Americans were a lot of times. Uh, so although I don't talk about Black's work, by implication, my work shows that the German eugenicists had a lot of the same ideas before the American. not totally before the Americans, but simultaneously at the same time. I mean, it was not a one-way street from America to Germany. Uh, in fact, it may have, in the early phase, I would even guess it may have been going more the other direction, maybe more from Germany to America uh, in the 1890s and er, in first decade. Uh, the Americans got the laws first, and that's what black jumps on. Uh, but the ideas were floating around in Germany long before those laws were passed here. Primarily because of Heckel and, and others like him? Yeah, Heckel, Heckel was promoting eugenics, yeah, very early on. He became part of the eugenics movement. The, Germany was the first country to have a journal devoted exclusively to eugenics. It was the first country to have an organization devoted exclusively to eugenics. 
The United States beat them in having a, a law first, a compulsory sterilization law, which was 1907 in Indiana. Uh, but in many other respects, Germany was ahead of them in, in thinking. Uh, there were professors of eugenics in Germany in the 1920s. Uh, so I mean, they had a pretty vigorous. There was a lot of interplay between the two movements. And certainly by the 1920s, there was American money that was flowing. And that's one thing he really does draw a lot on. I think that's a good point. There's a lot of American money, the Rockefeller Foundation and other uh, foundations in the US were funding a lot of the eugenics uh, things that were going on that fed ultimately into the Nazi eugenics movement. Great. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.